bring you a hot mix and controversies in various respiratory topics in coming days. Keep watching them and also remember we have started along with API EPICS webinar which is not only for the respiratory physicians but also from the physicians and it is in association with API. Keep watching that which is twice a month and of course Respinar which you have patronized so well in the last three months that we have reached almost each and every corner of India with the topics so interesting, intriguing, with moderators doing excellent job and bringing out the best from our panelists as well as experts who are the top notch pulmonologists in India. Keep watching and keep enjoying and keep sending your feedback to us. And I'm Dr. Deepak Talwar signing off as well as requesting you to continue watching this Respinas. Start, sir. So you I, may start, sir. Stage. I can't see the stage. Where is it? None of them is sure. And welcome to this uh, yet another Respinar. And uh, this Respinar is also on uh, GINA Update 2023. As all of you know about it, that uh, last Wednesday, we had a Respinar, which was the first one to start discussing updates of GINA 2023. The Respinar was carried by the uh, our moderator, uh, Professor Katiar, and we had uh, illuminaries along with us to discuss about uh, GINA 2023 update. Uh, some of the updates we could not uh, complete in the last uh, Respinar. And of course, there were a lot of questions from the audience which could not be addressed due to shortage of time. So we decided to have a part two of this Respinar. And this is again going to be moderated by Professor S.K. Katiar. And uh, it, it is being uh, uh, to discuss the aspects of the uh, update 23, which were not uh, included in the last Respinar. So without wasting much time, I will hand over the proceedings to Professor S.K. Katiar to carry on with this uh, GINA update 2023. Uh, in this Respinar, which is being organized under the Indian Society of uh, Chest, uh, <coughs> as well as uh, our knowledge partner, which is Glenmark. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Talwar. And um, can I share the screen, please? Yeah. So friends, uh, we are here again to discuss the remaining part of GINA 2000, 2023 in this part two program. In the part one, we have discussed certain new changes which have been made and whatever have remained, we'll be discussing them today. Um, we have an excellent um, uh, faculty with us and there are a few, two new additions as well. We have Professor Jinder as the lead expert, who has been one of the senior most uh, pulmonologists in the country. We have Ravin, Dr. Ravin Sarnayak, who is consultant at Leela Moore's Chest Clinic and Critical Care Unit at Nagpur, and he is the incoming. Um, he's the he's the in, he will be the incoming president also of Indian Chest Society. We have Professor Randeep Buleria with us, who is Chairman of the Institute of Internal Medicine and Respiratory and Sleep Medicine, Director of Medical Education at Medanta Gurgaon. And he recently has, um, uh, has retired from um, AIMS um, as Director 
of uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Of course, we, Dr. Deepak Talwar, the, the, the main um, architect of this program, is with us. Uh, is with us. Dr. Chandrakan Tarke, who is the pulmonologist at Apollo Hospital at Hyderabad, he has joined us. And Dr. Saurav Pahuja, pulmonologist uh, uh, from Amrita Hospital, Faridabad, is also with us this evening. So Dr. Chandrakan Tarke and Dr. Pahuja are the new additions in this part too. Friends, this is an initiative, as Dr. Talwar said, of uh, Indian Chess Society 2022-23, and our knowledge partner is Glenmark. Sorry to Asthma care for all is the theme of um, this year's um, um, uh, Gina's theme, and let us all contribute our best to this uh, theme of asthma care for all. Doctor, that's the that's screen mode, sir. It ah, is please, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sir. Yeah. And that's the document which was released only last week, which is under, which is under discussion. And uh, let me before um, we we come to the we, we come to the remaining changes. That let us uh, tell you in brief what was discussed last time in on last Wednesday. The changes that have uh, that have occurred in Dina two thousand twenty three as against Dina two thousand twenty two. So the only change that has occurred in uh, in in management of adults and adolescents, twelve years or more, what they have added is in track two. There used to be only as needed Saba in past, but there has been a study which has shown that uh, on ICN Saba as a reliever therapy, and this has been added in the 2023 guideline. The, but with this addition, the, uh, 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 the track one with as needed ICS formitrol is the preferred treatment approach for adults and adolescents despite the addition of ICS Saba in GINA track two. So in spite of this addition, the track two remains the, the, the management of choice. ICS formatrol yields better results at steps one and two, and steps three and five in terms of reduction in severe exacerbations, emergency uh, visits, and hospitalizations. And what Professor Jinder commented that day, perhaps, that perhaps in um, times to come, ICS formatrol will be, will be the treatment of uh, choice at uh, all steps. Then uh, another change which has occurred in the age group of six to 11 years is the addition at the step five of anti-interleukin-5, mepolizumab, which has been added to the maintenance treatment option at step five for children six to 11 years with severe eosinophilic asthma. If you look at this, it wasn't there earlier and it has come up uh, in the 2000. 23 guideline. Then um, another minor change what they have mentioned is they still are not, uh, uh, they are still, uh, they say there are insufficient evidence for daily controller therapy at step one as far as children of five years and younger are concerned. And this uh, few words have been added and still they continue to recommend uh, as and when required um, ICS inhaled ICS, inhaled corticosteroid therapy. That was the earlier 22 guideline. This was blank over there. And then this time, Gina has shown, has given emphasis on the environment as well. And what they have said is, it, it, they have, uh, in two ways, they have, um, uh, they have tried to be uh, to be eco friendly, and what they have said, what they have said is that as far as the devices are concerned for asthma management, they say the propellant used in it, the manufacturing of the of the device, and the recycling of the device, they should be the the the, the only those devices should be preferred 
which have got the lowest environmental impact. And they've also emphasized that um, the management, uh, the, the use of device should be, should be optimized in terms that you should have the right drug, you should have the right choice of the inhaler inhalation device, and you must always take the patient into consultation while choosing the device, the technique which is being used and the regularity, so that the serious, uh, severe exacerbations do not occur and patient is uh, maintained on this therapy. And their concern is that more is the use of uh, urgent healthcare facilities, greater is the environmental burden. So they have, they have said the safest and best innovation device should be selected for the patient and for the planet. So they have shown their concern for the first time as far as um, environment is concerned. Then they have also talked about uh, uh, the, the uh, management of um, severe asthma, which, which, which according to a report from Netherlands, about 4% patients belong to this uh, severe asthma group. And what they have said is the GINA has recommended the use of biologic therapy only for patients with severe asthma and only after treatment has been optimized. After the treatment has been optimized, after you have taken care of comorbidities, after uh, you have made you utilize the non pharmaceutical treatment, so when everything fails, then only the as a last resort, they have said the, uh, that biologics should be added to these patients of severe asthma. So these were some of the um, points which we discussed uh, last time, and now we come up uh, in the part two with um, the remaining. Uh, uh, new things which have been added to the GINA 2023 report. And the first of um, uh, the, the first issue that we will we will be discussing is is the role of imaging in the diagnosis of asthma. And this has been as a, added as a, as a as a new section in the in the um, in the report. What they have said is imaging is not routinely used in diagnosis of asthma. It may be useful to investigate possibility of comorbid conditions or alternative diagnosis in patients with difficult to treat asthma in adults and patient difficult to treat asthma in children, and also to identify congenital abnormalities in infants and asthma-like symptoms, with asthma-like symptoms. And then they say HRCT may be, um, may be useful, may be utilized for conditions like bronchiectasis, emphysema, lung nodules, airway wall thickening, lung distension, and may assess uh, airway distensibility. Chest imaging is not currently recommended to predict treatment outcomes or lung function decline or to assess treatment response. And then CT may be useful in cases who have got associated as a comorbid condition, chronic rhinosinusitis with or without nasal polyp. So this could be one important um, investigation, radiological investigation, which may be useful in this group of patients. Uh, and, and, um, and they have also said that uh, in severe asthma with um, chronic rhinosinitis, rhinosinitis um, with or without polyps, the, the, you, may, you may have to, it may help you in making a choice of the right biological therapy. With this little background, I taken into um, uh, Dr. Uh, Tarke, to give his uh, expert uh, expertise, expert comments on this issue of um, imaging in asthma as an as an add-on in the new guideline. Dr. Tarke, please. Dr. Chandkan Tarke, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. As uh, Gina said rightly, uh, this uh, role of imaging in asthma is there. Normally, uh, baseline, uh, usually we do the chest x-ray for every patient. and. Uh, as usual, X-ray will be normal in more majority of the asthma patient. But uh, we should do it as uh, some of the patient, they may have the ABP, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Some patient may have the bronchitis, and uh, some patient may have the alternative diagnosis such as COPD, bronchitis, even uh, cystic fibrosis, miss, any other diagnosis miss, which can be missed, uh, mislabeled as asthma. And even in some patient with the children, the short history of asthma may have even foreign bodies. That is the role of imaging. 
and especially sometimes we may require the ct scan uh, especially in the patients with the bronchiectasis and uh, if you want to rule out emphysema which may not be obviously visible on the ct scan but patient with the severe asthma which is not controlled we should rule out the alternative diagnosis of emphysema and bronchiectasis and also uh, uh, for the chronic sinusitis we should do the ct pns because this is also one of the important uh, factor for the uncontrolled asthma uh, with uh, chronic rhinosinusitis as a comorbidity uh, that in short uh, basic chest x ray should be done in the every asthmatic patient and measured the patient it will be normal only but if the patient we are considering as a comorbidity or if you are having uh, some uncontrolled asthma severe asthma we should go ahead with the advanced imaging such as the ct scan professor uh, jindal your expert comments well i i i think um, uh, what has been rightly said by you uh, as far as the gina guidelines are concerned and dr tarke has uh, nicely made the point you see i think uh, it is true that uh, imaging or chest x ray is not uh, routinely required in the diagnosis of asthma but i think it, it is still fair for all new cases at least to have one chest x ray to rule out the comorbid conditions and other diagnoses or complication but it is not necessary in fact it should not be done every time the patient comes or even uh, every few months it is not required as a follow up uh, investigation so i think that is true unless you suspect some complication some alternate diagnosis uh, whether it is bronchiectasis or uh, i think that is uh, that is what is generally agreed to so that oh, one should not go on prescribing x ray every time so that is so i think you are right because we must we should have a base baseline x ray yeah. and otherwise as and when required they can be done and specific things like um, ct chest or ct sinuses may be required um, if especially required if the symptoms uh, uh, give a clue to the diagnosis uh, of that kind the next issue is um, is the addition of pertussis as a dif- as a differential diagnosis because per- pertussis um, could be an alternative diagnosis also or could coexist with asthma and is also one of the one of the triggers for exacerbations of um, asthma so <clears throat> they have considered it as an alternative diagnosis presenting with those patients who have got a prolonged paralysis or coughing and sometimes with strider you should one should suspect um, a case of pertussis and is also it has been added as one of the triggers also because amongst the various uh, viral respiratory infections like rhinovirus influenza adenovirus respiratory syncytial viruses pertussis is also added amongst one of them which can trigger the asthma exacerbations uh, since dr galida has not been able to join yet uh, could dr um, jindal uh, give his comments on uh, this joined, new addition ah he is there very much thank you so much professor galida yeah so regarding pertussis i think what has happened in the recent guidelines is that gina recognizes that pertussis is especially in children the focus is in pertussis is predominantly as far as children is concerned that it can be a differential diagnosis from the point of view of uh, asthma because it can pre- present with prolonged spasmodic cough child may have strider and sometimes this may get wrongly uh, thought of as being an exacerbation of asthma and so therefore uh pertussis as a uh, alternate diagnosis should also be considered the other thing as you rightly said that it can also be a trigger or can be uh, one of the factors which may be the cause for acute worsening of asthma like the common respiratory viruses that have already been mentioned that one sees so i think this is just what uh, has been highlighted in the recent guidelines to really stress that you should not uh, that all that wheezes and all that coughs is not asthma you must always have your minds uh, open that it could be they should have a differential diagnosis in mind and also that it can be one of the triggers to worsening so both can happen and it could worsen an already st- existing stable asthma so i think this just to drive home this point and i think this is important from the pediatric age group point of view correct you are right professor jindal for your expert comments 
I agree with whatever has been said by Professor Guleria. <clears throat> the only thing is, I must admit that so far we have not really considered as important um, uh, diagnosis. <clears throat> Sorry, in adults in particular, you see, children, of course, uh, certainly it always comes in the differential diagnosis. Um, but at least in the West, it is important uh, even in, in adults as a trigger and they perhaps are giving routine vaccinations, etc. Maybe in future we should uh, be more uh, careful and cautious about this uh, consideration. So. Right. Thank you so much, Bruce. The, the next issue which, is, which will be discussed is about the asthma control questionnaire, in short, what we call as ACQ. The GINA 2023 report has made a recommendation for ACQ-5 over ACQ-6 or ACQ-7. This ACQ is used as a tool to identify different levels of symptom control to assess patient's progress. The 5 has got, uh, it comprises of 5 symptoms, symptoms questions. The ACQ-6 includes SABA frequency and ACQ7 includes pre-bronchodilator FEV1 percentage predicted also. GINA has preferred ACQ5 over 6 or 7 and does not recommend assessment tools that combine symptom control with exacerbation history. So, um, Dr. Salnayak, uh, your expert comments on this please. So, in fact, this ACQ, good evening, everybody. Thank you, sir. Uh, ACQs have been uh, practically extremely useful in reassessment and follow up the patient, as well as to confirm the adequate response to the treatment. If we look at the validity of ACQ 5, it has been universally used, and most of us have been interacting with our patients with basic five questions only. In addition to that, ACQ-6 and ACQ-7, it requires, uh, in fact, if we look at the validation, ACQ-5 has been sufficient enough. Anna has been rightfully recommending same. And most of the clinical practice, especially for the family physicians, these basic five questions, symptoms of the patient itself, usually gives a significant clue as to whether the patient clinical symptoms are true especially if there are nocturnal symptoms or daytime exacerbation of symptoms, the symptoms for itself uh, validate the significant control of asthma. So if we look at the asthma control questionnaire 5, that is uh, enough. I think uh, unless there is a pre-selected subset of patients where there is a uh, difficulty in understanding the clinical analysis, we can always take up additional supportive history. But again, uh, doing a FEV1 and validating it pre-bronchodilator FEV1 may not be matched with all the subsets of patients. But however, some of the ACQ the, for clinical trials, ACQ7 also has been validated. So if we go for the clinical practice, ACQ5 is enough. Yeah, true. Uh, if any of the experts want to give their comments, uh, expert comments on any of the issues, they may please uh, do so. Um, Professor Jindal, your expert comments on this? I think uh, nothing in particular. The, uh, there have been several these uh, questionnaires to kind of score asthma control or symptom control, and uh, ACQ five has been what is uh, recommended by GINA guidelines. And uh, Doctor Nayak has already clarified on the issue that, yeah. that that indicates the symptom control. I think that is what is important to uh, to realize because. Uh, GINA does not recommend a kind of composite uh, scoring, you see. So that's what uh, I agree with whatever has been said. And you can also um, continue because, um, uh, uh, because the next issue was composite asthma control tools concerning this only. So if you want to add anything on that. Yeah, I think the, it is important to remember that uh, in spite of good asthma control based on, for example, <laughs> the ACQ5, uh, there are more, many a patient will uh, have or can have acute exacerbations, you see, and they can also progress to develop persistent airflow obstruction. So there is no kind of uh, 
composite score uh, or asthma control tool which should not be used and both these things should be independently assessed symptom control is assessed with the help of acq5 uh, and the the acute exacerbation risk is assessed from the risk factors assessment you see and there are many risk factors which have been identified including the uh, saba use the non use of uh, inhaled corticosteroids and uh, obesity smoking uh, and uh, other factors which should be of course bad symptom control is also a factor for acute exacerbation but other risk factors should be independently assessed to see because um, uh, otherwise acute exacerbation in a well controlled asthmatic uh, can happen and may be missed if not uh, uh, considered appropriately so. thank you so much then um, coming to the next issue is um, management of asthma during the covid 19 pandemic that's a new addition to the 2023 jina report and according to it um, uh, the as far as the morbidity is concerned what they have said is the people with asthma are not at increased risk of acquiring covid 19 systemic reviews have not shown an increased risk of severe covid 19 in well controlled mild or moderate asthma studies also do not show that those with well controlled asthma are at increased risk of covid 19 related deaths one of the meta analysis shows the mortality to be lower than in people with without asthma so that was one of the finding risk of covid 19 death was increased in those who recently had a course of uh, oral corticosteroids for their asthma and in those patients who were hospitalized with severe asthma the mortality rate was high over there one of the study um, uh, of hospitalized patients in patient in uh, those who were 50 years plus with covid 19 shows lower mortality in those with asthma taking inhaled corticosteroids than in those without an underlying respiratory condition hence what they stress is it is important to continue good asthma management with the strategies to maintain good asthma control reduce the risk of acute severe exacerbations and minimize the need for oral corticosteroids they have also then said that um, the treatment in form of um, i in any cardiac steroid with or without lava add on therapies with uh, biological therapy for severe asthma those with severe asthma on long term oral cardiac steroids it should not be stopped abruptly because that may be dangerous and they also commented on um, the thing like uh, nebulization is not to be done routinely it is only to be done when life threatening situation is there because of fear of transmission of uh, uh, the of the sars virus to other people and uh, to healthcare workers and also to avoid spirometry as far as possible and if any um, uh, 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 aerosol generating procedure is to be used like oxygen therapy sputum induction manual ventilation iv or intubation the strict infection control measures must be followed in these patients and finally um, they have said that they have said about they have commented about um, the interaction of um, one of the antiretroviral drug that is used in this covid 19 in uh, with i with with inhaled corticosteroids combination with salmitrol or with vilentrol and they have said either i inhaled corticosteroid with formitrol should be used or an alternative antiviral therapy can be tried the covid 19 vaccine should be given to asthmatics and there are no allergic reactions and annual influenza vaccination should also be done and both covid and influenza injections while a vaccine can be given simultaneously simultaneously on the same day and we have with us uh, dr saurabh uh, pahuja who, who who will please give his expert comments on this issue of covid 19 and asthma dr saurabh please thank you sir so so the views of mine are agreed with the gina guidelines so gina guidelines clearly says that the mild to moderate patient are at less risk of developing covid 19 maybe the reason could be behind this is that these patients are already on some in maintenance dose of inhaled corticosteroid and we have seen in covid 19 over the past three years that those patients who develop even mild covid they respond to inhaled corticosteroid so that may be the one reason 
which can be there in these patients not developing a severe form of covid-19 but if we see the data the data clearly says those patients who have a severe asthma those patients who have a recent history of hospitalization due to asthma or those patients who have taken oral corticosteroid for asthma they are obviously at a greater risk of developing severe covid-19 so this statement should go in the public like if those who are severe asthmatic they should be more careful when they acquire covid-19 then the most important thing which we found in the past 3 years was majority of our asthmatic they left their treatment either they could not contact their doctors or they could not realize the importance of these drugs so these patients should be educated about the continuation of whatever medicine they has been taking as a maintenance treatment for asthma during their period of covid-19 even if they are not able to reach to their doctors then patients we have seen even when i was at metro for the last one year when i was doing a consultancy there we have seen and we have pulled up the data of patients who were on biologicals so majority of the severe asthmatic who were on biologicals they left their biologicals because of the reason that they could not contact their doctors so these patients especially who are taking biologicals and severe asthmatic they should continue whatever medications they are taking then coming to the part where the medications is considered they yes definitely inhaled therapies with the mdi and this should be considered over nebulizers in view of risk of spread of these infections to the other people in the society and in the other uh, vicinity then now recently this ritonavir and nirmaltavir drug has been recommended to be used in mild covid so people who will be having mild covid will be prescribed this drug but now the data says that this drug has an interaction with ics laba other than the formatrol so the like we have now in market vilantirol fluticasone combination we have in market salmetrol with other ics combination so data has shown that if you are using this drug there is high chances that there will be a toxicity cardiac toxicity due to this laba so especially for those patients whom we are prescribing this antiviral we should ideally tell them that they should prefer an ics formatrol combination rather than taking a ics vilantirol or a ics salmetrol and yes as we all know that vaccination is an important part as far as the asthma management or any chronic disease management is considered so these patients should be pushed to take both the medications not just covid but to be forced to take their influenza medication also because we have seen in the past few years people have become reluctant towards taking influenza but they are routinely taking their covid vaccination for the management thank you dr pauja professor jinder lay our expert comments please well i agree with whatever has been said that um, it is true that during the covid uh, pandemic there were very few asthma exacerbations and even now when the patients come they said they were well uh, during that period the problems arose because of logistics as have been said that um, they couldn't contact the doctors especially for biological therapy and so on otherwise um, partly because of the public hygienic measures uh, hand washing use of mask and uh, social distancing and so on so the the uh, viral infections other than covid uh, were very few see so i think uh, and treatment of course uh, most of the treatment has been common to both disease asthma and covid so especially mild patients or even moderate uh, kind of severity patients uh, were well you see they in fact were happy on the other hand sometimes severe asthmatics they uh, found problems you see uh, and um, i think dr pahuja has uh, already told the other details and um, though covid is not that much a problem now but the same i mean if for, for as far as nebulization or spirometry is concerned same guidelines will go for um, other uh, contagious viral infections of uh, respiratory system because we'll keep on getting these cases in future as well but do you think professor jindal is it um, really uh, the nebulization the, the 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 kind of uh, terror has been created because of uh, spread of infection through nebulization is it really that big a issue because the, it is said that the 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 aerosol that is produced is in the nebulizer and it doesn't touch the walls of the bronchial tree and if it touches it, it gets stuck over there so how how come it can carry back uh, unless a patient coughs or sneezes during the procedure how can a virus be carried 
with the aerosol and that can infect others well I, i suppose it is a general precaution which should be used and yeah. the isolation if done within a for example closed uh, room you see and individual patients is using then it should not cause much of problem in any case uh, uh, but hospital nebulization obviously uh, may be avoided because of uh, patient may be coughing or uh, uh, or other even otherwise there is some fear you see that it may may spread in fact um, recently the some of the experts have sat together and made a scoring system uh, for whom to give nebulization or not that paper is already accepted in the journal of association of physicians of india and it is due to come very soon i think that is perhaps a very good scoring system which can be used even at the primary care level uh, to to decide about the nebulization when to give and when not not to go and is very easy to calculate yes That's thank good. you so much dr guleria you like to make any comment on this no not really i think uh, all the points have actually been covered uh, i do agree that it's important that people be aware of the drug interaction which happens with the drug which is now being used more commonly paxlovid there are a lot of indian companies making this drug and it is being used uh, in covid 19 so the drug interaction with ics salmetrol and velintrol is something that should be out there that people are aware of it or because of the side effects that can happen also i think uh, we must uh, push as much as we can especially in uh, patients with chronic respiratory disease for the influenza vaccine along with the covid-19 vaccine thank you so much so the next issue is advice on potential drug interactions and we already have discussed about uh, the drug interactions related to covid-19 the only other uh, 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 thing that has been discussed in the report is about the abpa and there is a potential for drug interaction with itraconazole and asthma medications and these interactions uh, may lead to increased risk of uh, inhaled corticosteroid adverse effects like adrenal suppression or cushing syndrome or increased risk of cardiovascular effects of um, some of the lavas like salmetrol and velintrol so it may be appropriate to switch to an alternative product like budesonide formitrol or mamotrexone formitrol till itraconazole is continued professor chandrakant uh, dr chandrakant tarke would you like to uh, give your expert comments on this issue please i uh, sir already discuss uh, guleria sir and dr saurabh told uh, in the covid 19 pandemic this paxlovid that is nirmatrelvir and ritonavir is commonly used and uh, in the mild cases and uh, those patient who having asthma who are on the either on salmetrol or velintrol the combination with ics uh, they may stop the medications and uh, based on the interaction but they may develop the asthma exacerbation if you stop it that's why the person the doctor who is advising and the patient also should know yes there is a interaction but uh, we should have some alternative uses also we should switch to alternative such as ics formitrol or any other medication and uh, especially with the patient with the cardiac comorbidities patient who are having qtc prolongation and uh, we should avoid uh, this combination especially with the uh, paxlovid we should avoid the uh this uh ubilantrol and salmetrol combination and also the uh, asthma patient will have some patient will have the abpa and uh, commonly used drug is itraconazole along with the steroid uh this also may significantly increase uh, salmetrol levels by after the inhalation and we uh, person can get the qt prolongation palpitation or sinus tachycardia and uh, that's why we should closely monitor or we can switch to some alternative agents uh that's the reason this importance of uh, drug interaction in the patient with asthma especially with the covid-19 and uh, abpa thank you professor dr tarke dr uh, professor jindal like to make any expert comments why oh, I, i agree with whatever has been said there is a potential interaction between in particular with itraconazole uh, although i don't think it is a very common experience in in a routine practice you see partly maybe uh, only some of the patients are using itraconazole uh, 
and the, there are so many other things you see which goes on so but uh, one must be aware of all these interactions yeah. as has been pointed out i agree with that thank you so the next issue is about the uh, fe no guided management of asthma well um, uh, in, in general the fe no has not been shown to have much uh, role in reducing uh severe exacerbations or um uh, 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 episodes leading to hospitalization other things and it may be useful in patients with severe asthma in underlying inflammatory phenotypes by blood or sputum eosinophils for their eligibility to various add on treatments including biological therapy so that could be one uh, use of it a high baseline blood eosinophil count and our if you know predicts good therapeutic response to some biological therapies professor uh, guleria your comments please your expert comments on this please so i think i will tend to agree with this uh, what happened was that uh, in the past when pheno came came in one looked at whether it was useful for the diagnosis or for the management of asthma a lot of studies showed that uh, because of the different phenotypes that we know exist in asthma the utility of uh, uh, phenol in diagnosing um, asthma was not really there and it was did not prove to be useful in the management of uh, asthma there were some initial studies which tended to show that a pheno guided th therapy may be better uh, than a uh, guidelines based therapy or symptom based therapy uh, that also was led to a meta analysis i think in 2016 which tended to show that was there was some benefit but what gina has highlighted is that more recently well conducted studies have really not shown any benefit of pheno guided therapy as far as uh, asthma is concerned even in those uh, if you remember there used to be a time when we said if your pheno is more than 50 parts per million you should consider giving inhaled corticosteroids because you would you are put into the bracket of being steroid responsive and you may respond to inhaled corticosteroids that data has not been subsequently been sort of validated and therefore gina has highlighted the fact that pheno may be an adjunct but it cannot really help you in deciding management as far as asthma is concerned there is some data which suggests that pheno may help in deciding which patient may respond to certain biologicals now that we have an array of biologicals available if you have a pheno elevated you could argue that this may there may be a better response to drugs like amalizumab anti ige therapy or uh, drugs like mepolizumab which are uh, targeted against IL-5 that is only the only place where i think uh, uh, the use of pheno could be useful people use it as an adjunct and as an adjunct it may be useful but i don't think that what we were looking for many years ago that you could have a pheno guided therapy for the management of asthma has borne out to be true and therefore it has limited role both in the diagnosis and management of asthma true so um, it has got limited role to play as far as the Uh, rightly said by in the diagnosis or management of asthma with that we pass on to the the professor uh, jinder like to add anything not really i i agree with whatever uh, dr guleria has said uh, i think it is most of the time the management is decided based on the risk factors as well as symptom control scoring in cs as well thank you So the next uh, issue is update on evidence. There has been an update on evidence on digital interventions for adherence to treatment because adherence is a very important uh, issue, and um, ways and means are being uh, seen that can uh, make adherence better. So, what is the role of digital interventions that has been updated in this um, report? Uh, there has been a Cochrane review which shows, uh, which has found that a variety of digital intervention strategies improved adherence to maintenance control or treatment. It reduced exacerbations, improved asthma control both in adults and children. Electronic monitoring or maintenance, uh, electronic monitoring of uh, inhaler use, and uh, text messages on phone were uh, found to be very effective. effect of these interventions on quality of life lung functions and unscheduled healthcare utilization are still unclear dr sarnayak um, your uh, expert comments regarding digital interventions in um, asthma as far as the adherence of treatment is concerned 
Dr. Sonai, please. Yes, sir. So adherence to the treatment, especially for the asymptomatic or the milder uh, bronchial asthma patient has been really universal problem. And uh, this is one very important area of digital intervention and the data collection, which can be remotely practiced. And there are lots of now Indian centers uh, where lots of clinical trials are ongoing. And our own experience has been, this is one of the excellent methods to monitor and it definitely improves the adherence and control of bronchial asthma. And with the availability of the smartphones with uh, even the rural population, it is not very difficult to keep assisting and at least communicating through text messages regarding the compliance to the treatment. However, uh, to apply it to the clinical practice in day-to-day -day practice for the public utility or the, the public hospital, uh, for all the patients to generalize these implications, it would take some time in developing countries like ours. But if we individual patient or identify a patient who is otherwise poorly controlled or difficult to control, this would be one of the important remedies which definitely would improve the compliance, uh, control of asthma, as well as exacerbation. Professor Jindal, your comments, expert comments, please. Well, I will say I agree with the the evidence which has been shown and incorporated in the GINA guidelines. But I must say that uh, experience in this country uh, at the present is, uh, is hardly any. This may be so in some of the, some of the centers or some of the big cities. And especially because the patients of asthma uh, are younger population. So they are more likely to... <laughs> But the doctors are so busy and they, for them generally to keep track of these uh, uh, patients, what uh, electronic monitoring uh, is generally difficult. I will say it is a remote kind of uh, application uh, for this in our clinical practices. Thank you so much. Before I go to the next... I don't know what is the experience yeah. of others you see. I mean. Anybody would like to make any expert comment on this, please? If no, uh, let me, before I go to the next issue, let me request the audience to keep sending their questions, whatever they want to ask the, our experts in the chat box. And um, at the end of this discussion, we'll take up the questions. So the next uh, uh, issue is um, on the nasal and sinus disease as comorbidity in asthma. And... Um, Professor Jindal will uh, will give his experts comment on this about rhinitis and uh, chronic rhinosinusitis. Both have been uh, has been discussed in the new um, report under separate heads. And the, what is the importance of rhinitis and what is the importance of uh, chronic rhinosinusitis in the management of uh, as a comorbid condition in the management of asthma? Professor Jindal, please. Well, I think uh, both rhinitis and uh, chronic rhinosinusitis have been dealt separately in the new GINA guidelines that uh, you have pointed out. And uh, rhinitis, of course, is very common. And it is said that uh, uh, almost 10 to 40 percent of patients uh, of uh, allergic rhinitis have asthma. See. So, and the treatment is best given with intranasal corticosteroid, either sprays or uh, other application. On the other hand, chronic rhinosinusitis is, uh, of course, when there is involvement of uh, sinuses and it is a chronic disease, there may be polyp formation or there may be without polyp formation. And the symptomatology here is, uh, is more the severe. You see nasal blockade, post-nasal drip headache and uh, sometimes heaviness of the face, etc. So, uh, of course, the treatment, general treatment remains the same, but investigations will require nasoendoscopy and CT of the sinuses, etc. And um, surgical therapy, of course, for polyps may be considered. Besides the standard therapy for asthma and rhinitis, uh, biological therapy in particular has been uh, recommended and they say this may be helpful for both not only asthma but also for uh, uh, for rhinosinusitis so, so, uh, but it has been dealt given separate importance and uh, it is important to to recognize uh, either of these conditions simultaneously 
Thank you, Professor Indra. The next is, um, issue is transitioning of adolescents with asthma from pediatric to adult life. But as the um, as the as the age progresses, the there um, the, the, there is a physical, emotional, cognitive, and social changes occurring during adolescence. Asthma control during this phase may improve or worsen. Remissions are also sometimes seen, but they are seen more in common. They are more common in males, and uh, exploratory attitude. And risk taking behavior of the adolescents is another factor which may have impact on asthma management, like smoking. Then, adherence to inhaled corticosteroids in this age group is different, may be different. And to improve adherence during, trans during transitions, self management should be encouraged by use of technology like web based apps and tools in this age group. Medications should be tailored, that is very important to the adolescent's needs and lifestyle. Adolescents with mild asthma, use of as needed low-dose low, low ICS formatrol. So this is um, again of use in um, this age group as well. So Dr. Saurabh, um, your uh, expert comments on this issue, please. Yes, sir, I agree with whatever has you have told uh, through this slide. So as we have seen, and if we see the previous data of 1950s to 1960s, there used to be a time when people used to think that it, if a child is having an asthma, if he goes on to his adult life, roughly 30% will have a remission. But then the latest data from 2009-2010 came and that suggested roughly 70% will have a remission of their asthma. But there is one problem with those who are having ad adolescent or a childhood asthma when they go on to continuing their asthma in the adult life. So usually these kind of patients we have seen that they are more prone to have severe asthma, especially if their asthma persisted from their adolescent to adult life. So specifically for these patients, we need to be more cautious. We need to tell them that they have a persistence of asthma into their adult life. So they need to be focused more on their management. And now as rightly said, ki we are living in a world of technology. A lot of digital equipments are there to check the lung functions, to check the compliance of the drug. And adults nowadays or adolescents who are developing adults are very uh, used to using these gadgets, these apps, these tools. So more focus on these things can make them convenient with using their medications rather than calling them again and again. Because nowadays we know everybody is so busy with their work. So we can tell them about the digital uh, utilization of these tools as far as their management as well as their control of asthma is there. Then definitely we have seen and Gina is in 2019 rightly said that a transition from SABA alone as a reliever to ICS LABA needs to be done. And these adult, ad adults who are continuing their asthma from childhood, they have a habit of taking these SABAs because our pediatric colleagues are very fond of giving these SABA drugs. So we need to tell them this transition that now as far as the latest data, latest guidelines are considered, they specifically tell that ICS formatrol as a reliever is much better as far as their control of asthma is considered as compared to SABA alone. So definitely understanding their needs, understanding their adventure uh, activities, we need to tell them the utilization of these drugs. Yeah, definite. And one more important point, we need to tell them the harmful effect of smoking, especially in these people who already has a poor lung function, who already has a disease which, can, which is affecting their airways. Smoking will be an additive thing to that and will synergistically increase the inflammation in their airways and may lead to develop them a poor asthma as well as a severe asthma. Thank you, Dr. Saurabh. Professor Jindal, your uh, comments, please. So I think broadly, I agree with whatever has been said by Dr. Uh, Pohuja and of course, uh, as per the guidelines, you see. But I, uh, many of us have fairly long experience now uh, of asthma managing asthma from childhood to adult life. I would say there are relatively um, few people who continue to develop or continue to complain of asthma, you see, uh, from childhood to, to adolescence and then, of course, to adulthood. You see. There is a period of quiescence in between. You see. Many of these children who are very severe or um, a controllable asthma in childhood or adolescence, uh, uh, if they are treated properly, then they remain well for uh, 
sometimes for several decades you see two three four decades and then they may develop again you see when it is more severe that i i agree so continued asthma perhaps is a, from ad- adolescence to adulthood may not be as uh, uh, as frequent as uh, perhaps uh, it was thought in the past but certainly it does not go away totally you see and it uh, comes later in life yeah and true that is true thank you professor jindal and then the issue of fragility fractures um, the, the 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 new report says that um, the exposure to cumulative adverse effect of exposure to oral, oral corticosteroids they not only produce osteoporosis but also create fragility fractures and that's a serious concern in the in the older age group affecting their quality of life they not they do not they, they have not given any separate section for this but included uh, this uh, fact at different uh, places where were required so will professor dr tarke chandkan tarke uh, like to give his comments on this issue please uh, yes sir there has been a long concern regarding the use of steroids especially oral steroids is a well documented evidence and even with the inhaled steroids also the evidence is coming uh, both of these medications either oral or inhaled corticosteroids in over the long period of time it can cause osteopenia osteoporosis and fragility fractures fragility fracture is uh, just fracture which is defined as a fall from the uh, just in the normal routine activity just from the standing height or in the routine rest position also if the patient is getting fractures especially elderly people they get the fracture in the wrist or in the vertebra or in the uh, hip uh, there was a one uh, cohort study which was published in european respiratory journal in 2021 in uk based population they matched the age sex and uh, uh, the matched population and they found that irrespective of the uh, age sex and everything uh, the asthma people will have 12 12 percent more increased risk of fracture uh, they have not told clearly whether it, they were on the oral steroids or inhaled steroids but in general if you see the asthma people asthma people have 12 percent increased risk of fracture the reason behind this is the use of steroid and uh, in that study they told the asthma patient those who are using more than six uh, oral courses of corticosteroid for exacerbation at a higher risk of uh, fragility fractures than those who are no less than the six courses of oral corticosteroids that's the reason uh, we should consider uh, the risk of fractures especially in the elderly people on frequent use of oral steroids and also we should scan them uh, especially the dexa scan and appropriately we should diagnose and we can treat with the bisphosphonates and one more important thing uh, that is important if the asthma is controlled on the minimal dose of inhaled steroid we should maintain on that and uh, lowest possible dose should be used uh, to control the asthma thank you dr tarke professor jindal uh, any comments on this please oh, i think i agree there is no uh, the risk of uh, fragility fractures or stopenia is is very high with the oral uh, use of corticosteroids uh, it is very rarely i think although it, it has been described that osteopenia can occur with chronic use of inhaled corticos high dose inhaled corticosteroid but the risk is mostly with oral and has yeah. been well discussed you see right thank you so much then about the, uh, the about the non pharmacological therapies the physical activity uh, um uh professor randeep guleria will discuss this issue that uh, how how much how much help do we get from these physical activities and what kind of activities uh whether there has been any work done on that and um what about the role of aerobic exercises and about swimming which which uh, which could be more helpful so issues pertaining to the physical activity as far as the management of uh, as my is concerned professor guleria please thank you i think uh, when we talk of non pharmacological therapy is very very important because often one looks at only the, the pharmacological therapy as far as asthmatics are concerned and we don't
can't hear Dr. Guleria. Is there any? Can you hear me now? Uh, now it is okay. Yeah. So sorry, I think there was a little interruption. Okay. So what I was saying was that uh, as far as uh, treatment is concerned, we talk a lot of non-pharmacological uh, therapy, but it's very important for us to focus on non-pharmacological therapy as far as asthma is concerned. And uh, before we come to physical activity, I think it's also very important, as we've already discussed in the past, to really emphasize the importance of uh, not avoiding smoking, the, for, uh, the issues of environmental tobacco smoke. And now in the younger generation, when we're talking of adolescents, the whole issue of vaping, which is coming up in a big way among the younger generation, all of this has been shown to be one of the triggers or hump of cor and can cause poor control as far as asthma is concerned. Physical activity is something which Zena has tried to push on in a big way because of uh, evidence which shows that physical activity is important. It's important to remember that although we encourage aerobic exercises uh, uh, as far as asthmatic is concerned, a lot of data even from our center uh, at Ames and from other institute shows that even, ex even breathing exercises which include yoga uh, have also been shown to be very useful as far as asthma is concerned and have actually helped in bringing down the medication that the patient has required. Only thing is when we ask for aggressive physical activity, you must keep in mind that you can have exercise-induced bronchial uh, reactivity. And that is something that patients should be informed of. And if they have symptoms, then one should look at warming up before exercise, taking uh, a Saba or a low-dose ICS formatrol before the exercise. And this could help as far as exercise is concerned, as was mentioned by Professor Katyar. Swimming also has been shown to be useful in terms of improving lung function and cardiopulmonary fitnesses. Avoid, along with that, it's also important that we discuss other things with our patients, uh, including avoiding very different types of medication, which can lead to worsening of asthma, including non-steroid anti-inflammatory. Uh, that can also cause uh, worsening, and that is something that we need to keep in mind. I think one thing that we don't push as much as we should in our asthmatics is weight reduction, especially in those who are overweight and who have obesity. Yeah. Because there is enough data which shows that obesity by itself is a pro-inflammatory state leading to inflammation in the airways. And it also alters lung function in terms of uh, the abdominal fat that is collected. So uh, focus on diet and weight reduction is something that also needs to be done. Along with that, of course, uh, indoor and outdoor air pollution is something which is also a cause of concern. We see that during the winter months, especially in the indo gangetic uh, belt, because of air pollution, there is worsening of asthma and asthma control becomes poor. So various issues like this also we need to address, including um, other issues which could uh, also be there, like uh, workplace uh, exposure, which can lead to worsening of asthma, which is also something that one leads, uh, needs to follow. And in, in especially in... in uh, in women, especially of the younger age group, emotional stress can also be something that needs to be tackled uh, from the non-pharmacological uh, therapies rather than just giving inhaled steroids and bronchodilators. So I think we must look at the non-pharmacological therapies in a very comprehensive manner when we are actually looking at treating our asthmatics. Yeah, true. And rightly said, yoga is something which is still missing from um, Gina reports and um, I don't know, uh, maybe because of lack of data, but sometimes Gina will include uh, uh, something based only on single reports. So I think the enough data is available from our country as well, as far as yoga is concerned. And we have all found it to be very useful in our patients of uh, asthma. Professor Jindal, uh, you'd like to make any comments on this, please? I think you have made the right point. You see, the physical activity, of course, is even more important than the pharmacological therapy and uh, it uh, kind of causes body conditioning as well as mental relaxation as Radeep has already uh, Randeep has discussed it very thoroughly. Uh, yoga possibly I think we do not have a kind that kind of data which normally mm. the people uh, would believe you see or rely upon. That is uh, that must be created uh, it may be as a as a kind of network study by perhaps the Indian Chess Society itself, you see, yeah. it's an important uh, issue which comes every time you see that uh, the role of yoga. We keep on saying, the Indians keep on saying, but uh, uh, the books do not really, yeah. really include it in their, in their text.
Dr. Talwar, may please make a note of it that uh, can ICS help us uh, in this regard, creating some kind of data through some um, multi-center studies or something like that. Outdoor air pollution is uh, another uh, important issue as far as uh, asthma is concerned, and there are enough reports available now which say that uh, air pollutants like ozone, nitrogen oxides, acid, acidic aerosols, and particulate matter can exacerbate these symptoms of asthma, can lead to uh, patients may have, may, are made to visit emergency department, admissions may be required. And what has been seen by digital monitoring is that um, uh, the high levels of pollutants, two to three days after that, there's an increase in the use of asthma drugs. Then it has also been seen that uh, the those people who are residing near the main roads, the highways, those schools and homes which are near that, they've got a greater morbidity. And um, certain weather and atmospheric conditions like thunderstorms, they can make asthma worse. And it is advised to avoid strenuous outdoor physical activity in the patient asthma, and they should stay indoors during unfavorable environmental conditions like a weather which is very cold, low humidity, or high air pollution. Dr. Sarnayak, um, like to make expert comments on this, please. It's not only the outdoor air pollution. In fact, if we go through the last uh, two, three decades, the asthma uh, management or the control plan, always on the top and inverted commas, the bold letters, avoidance of trigger is one of the prime uh, education that the patient is required. And then with the ongoing time, the patients have so busy schedule, uh, maybe for children, it is schools, and then of course for adults, they so their work and the business, that they are almost overlooking the environmental pollution. And in fact, it is already uh, well enumerated on this slide itself that once there is an acute exacerbation of asthma, even the particulate matter dust particles in the environment can keep uh, triggering the bronchospasm or whatever the twitchy airways. Apart from that, we also have been experiencing uh, certain cities are little more polluted as compared to the cleaner cities. Our own experience has been a uh, few of the asthma patients, if they are not taking adequate precaution of or anticipating the pollution-induced bronchospasm. Many times they travel to Delhi or Bangalore and within a day, they have to come back because of acute uh, symptoms that they tend to develop uh, just by change of place. So we have to really consider this, educate our patients. Once they are well-educated, at least they should have a good uh, maintenance therapy uh, when they are trying to visit these areas which are likely to be more polluted. Of course, beyond that would be, of course, change of the season, change of environment. All these things, uh, most of the patients may overlook when they have a pressure regarding their work. So we have to keep educating, reminding them. And of course, uh, we should have some uh, asthma educator in the specialty clinics where they can uh, keep reminding these patients about this particular aspect of because this definitely is highlighted in GINA guideline and it is an excellent, in fact, it's a very important uh, preventive measure that most of the patient's severity of symptoms can definitely be well controlled. And right in the slide, again, it mentions that number of hospitalization, emergency visits, many times uh, abruptly come up in few hours. Uh, in fact, uh, that's what all of us have been experiencing. Thank you, Dr. Sarnayak. Professor Jinder, your comments, please, expert comments, please. No, I think it's true. The pollution is important uh, trigger, you see, or risk factor. But uh, not only the outdoor air pollution, the indoor air pollution, yeah. the micro environment perhaps is even more important because uh, uh, one is constantly exposed to the micro environments at home, in the offices, and even in the transport kind of uh, vehicles and other public places, theaters. and So that is uh, very important to... Uh, to control in that sense, you see, and avoid uh, for these patients. And environmental tobacco smoke is another important, uh, has been pointed out earlier by Professor Guleria. Uh, it, is, it is quite important uh, trigger, you see. So that should all, I don't think whether the GINA has really included that in, uh, in their section, but uh, it, it, it perhaps needs to be covered in greater detail, you see. Professor, the next is um, vaccination policy in asthma, and Professor Jinder will uh, uh, give his um, will tell us something about uh, the what kind of policy is being followed in asthma. 
Professor Jinder Prez. Well, sir, as you have uh, summarized here, that the it is known that the risk of influenza infection can be reduced by annual vaccine. Whether the annual vaccination reduces uh, asthma attacks uh, is not clear, but there is a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, which included a lot of observational studies and some of them were biased, you see, perhaps biased, which show that it does reduce uh, the the excavations, asthma excavations. So in, uh, I think it is uh, true uh, that annual vaccination with influenza uh, is going to be helpful, but the recommendation has been that you should follow the local uh, kind of vaccination policy for this. Whether the pneumococcal vaccine uh, avoids or helps these patients, uh, that is not clear. Uh, and uh, I don't think there is good evidence to say so. Uh, so one can follow the, the local policy, you see, uh, as has been done. COVID vaccination, of course, has been covered earlier and uh, uh, it is helpful and can be given with influenza vaccination and on the same day as well. Thank you, Professor Jindal. And the last uh, thing that we are going to talk about is about the terminology of asthma medications. They have given some clarifications uh, and meaning of this, and they, what they've done is they've, they've added a new table on different uh, terminologies for various types of asthma medications, like maintenance, maintenance treatment, controller treatment, reliever, anti-inflammatory reliever, and uh, maintenance and reliever therapy. So I don't think there's much to um, uh, to say about this. Dr. Saurabh would like to comment uh, on this, please. So, so, so that, was, that is what they have added there, yes. So they have added, sir, now the five different kind of categories. But just to summarize, I would say we just need two or th two things only to remember. Just one will be that there is a drug which is called as a maintenance treatment. Now the maintenance treatment is which is to be taken usually by the patient on a daily basis and it controls the inflammation as well as the asthma symptoms of the patient. Now, this maintenance can be anything. It can be an ICS. It can be an ICS-LABA combination. It can be a triple therapy. Now, we are using frequently triple therapy in asthmatics also, especially as far as the step 4 and step 5 is considered. So, it can be an ICS-LABA-LAMA as well as the biologicals and leukotriene receptor antagonists which are used. So, these all drugs which maintain the symptom of the patient are known as maintenance therapy. Then comes the second category of reliever therapy. So previously we used to have Saba as a reliever. Now after 2019, we all are frequently using ICS Lava as a reliever therapy also. So now if we see the current GINA guidelines, they say clearly that Saba has not to be used alone. So effectively the reliever, which nowadays any one of us is using, either he is using a Saba with ICS or he is, is using a Lava with ICS. Both the therapies contains an anti-inflammatory agent also. So better is to remember that nowadays we are all using anti-inflammatory relievers. Nobody is using alone Saba and even the GINA doesn't recommend that you use alone Saba. So there will be a maintenance therapy for the patient. Then there will be anti-inflammatory reliever therapy, which will definitely include an ICS as has been told by GINA, whether you use step one, track one or you choose track two. Then comes the concept of MART therapy, which GINA has brought three or four years ago. So you can use the same inhaler as a maintenance therapy and you can use the same inhaler as a reliever therapy, which is known as smart therapy and sometimes also as the smart therapy because single inhaler is used as a maintenance and a reliever therapy. So we have two combination of drugs which can be used as smart therapy. Those are formatrol with beclomethasone and formatrol with budesonide. Majority of us are using formatrol with budesonide as both maintenance as well as reliever therapy. We need to remember that the other combination of formatrol with fluticasone or salmetrol with fluticasone or vilentrol with fluticasone, they all can be used as a maintenance therapy. But as far as their role in reliever therapy is there, it is not re yet recommended. So if you are talking about MART therapy, only two drug combination, formatrol budesonide and formatrol with beclomethacine needs to be used as a MART therapy. If you are mm -hmm. using any of the other combination of LABA ICS, then you need to use another reliever with them. So that way you have two inhalers in those track two group. But in track one, you can use the same as maintenance as well as reliever. So with this, uh, this was the last uh, issue we wanted to discuss. I think we have um, 
been able to discuss most of the new things that have been added to the uh, new GINA report 2023. And we've discussed most of the important things uh, which were new into it. With this, we come to an end to this discussion. Then any comments you'd like to make, Dr. Professor Jindal? No, it's okay. So I think we can take up, take up some questions because uh, we could not do justice to the questions last time. Hello, Mr. Mayur? Yes, yes, sir, it's there the chat, chat room, sir. sir. So, there so are three questions, questions that just come up. So, I'll read so I'll it for you, for you sir. sir. You are echoing. Mayur. Yeah, it is not an echo there now. You are, you are in two devices. Shall I read the question, sir? Yeah, please, sir. So, the, there is a question from uh, Dr. Satar Hussain that is chest imaging helpful in occupational asthma? Um, Professor Jinder, would you like to make any comment? Well, I, I will say that um, the policy is almost similar as far as other asthmatics are concerned. Um, the first time it should be done, but the diagnosis of occupational asthma is largely based on uh, history. You see that um, history of exposure and uh, onset of symptoms and so on. But certainly for any new patient, uh, chest imaging is important. And subsequently, it should be done only if you suspect some other uh, complication or uh, comorbidity and so on. That's what uh, would be my take up. Sir, I, I want to ask one thing, sir, Dr. Katyar and Dr. Jindal both are there, Randeep is also there, that uh, it was like a little surprising for a CTPNS to get into the, in the uh, algorithm, uh, although they mentioned in severe asthma, but the sensitivity and specificity of CTPNS is uh, quite low, considering that it is being <laughs> recommended in this uh, algorithm. What's uh, like, how, how do we take this, sir? Professor Guleria. Dr. Jindal, please, yeah, please. Yeah, Professor Jindal. No, no, I just want to say that uh, many times the, the recommendations which are made in the guidelines, especially the GINA or GOLD, you see, uh, there are a lot of uh, issues. It is not only the practical experience which we have or uh, they may have. Sometimes there is a one or the other report which says it is helpful So or some kind of... <laughs> It is always how much stress you can make to your point, you see, in the in the group uh, which is formulating the guidelines. I would I, I would like to ask uh, the panel that adding a recommendation based on a single publication, how justifiable it is because uh, is it not premature to add it into the report so that it is implemented all over the world and uh, say next year or two, you uh, the other reports which uh, do not agree with that. So is it quite right to do that? Well, I suppose we, we need not go into those details for the time being. Those who are involved in formulation of some guidelines know that there are many things you see who can uh, stress a point better than others. Uh, and that's why the, the guidelines also keep on changing every year. And uh, there are differences in guidelines uh, from country to country, you see. Uh, but so one, one has to, and it is not a kind of, uh, the, any guideline, I will say, you see, is not something which is uh, uh, written in stone, you see. You, one should use one's own uh, mind and other uh, practical points and perhaps local guidelines sometimes are more important uh, as well. Maybe Randeep can also make a point on this issue. Yeah, so I would agree with that, that, you know, guidelines are only to guide you. They're not something which are actually written in stone. And I think there is also a little bit of issue of what is the practical real world scenario as compared to what comes out from certain studies. And sometimes there is a lot of hype uh, with one study and it shows that it may be useful the guidelines tend to push for it, but subsequent data tends to show that it may or may not be useful. 
we just saw that now Fino really is not finding much of a place as far as asthma is concerned. If you look back in the previous uh, issues, Fino guided therapy was something which was being looked at in a big way. So I think uh, sometimes the guidelines jump on something just to make it more sensational. But uh, with experience, people realize that it's not that uh, useful and it gradually changes with time. Right. So, yeah, please, one more question. Can I read, Dr. Katia? Yeah, please. Please do. So, I think that this is just uh, in continuation with that, that uh, Dr. Dipender Rai from Patna has asked that, uh, what is the best predictor of response to anti-IL-5 drugs? Is it blood eosinophil, sputum eosinophil, or pheno, or a corticosteroid dependency? Page 250 of Gina, he has even mentioned that uh, they are talking about this in uh, Gina, page 250. I think you should take this point, you see. <laughs> I think he <laughs> does not the best person for okay. this. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, the biomarkers, Dependar, are being looked into again and again that uh, which one is the best biomarker. And by far, actually, we have not been able to find a best biomarker. But yes, for NTIL-5s, the eosinophil is a definite, a very important marker. Whether you do it in blood or sputum, is the matter of convenience, but we do uh, realize that sputum eosinophil would be a better than the blood eosinophil, although the correlation is very good, but correlation is poor when the blood eosinophil is less than 100 and still you can have sputum eosinophil 2% or more than that. So I think there it makes a difference where you need a sputum eosinophil. How, how, as far as pheno is concerned, pheno is a biomarker of actually IL-4, IL-13 activity, IL-13 marker. So it won't be good for IL-5, but definitely for IL-4, 13 marker, the pheno is good because we find that even after giving anti-IL-5s, pheno levels do not fall down much in certain group of people who are actually the candidates for anti-IL-4, 13 inhibitor, which is duplimumab. Finally, coming to one thing which is up as a good biomarker is a mucus score on the CT scans. And this mucus is a actually a one extension of the, uh, the IL-5 as well as IL-4. So these are the ones which are also producing eosinophils, a lot of mucus. And if there is a mucus impaction in the, in the, in the bronchi, then that is an indicator that the anti-IL-5 drug will work better in these group of patients because it has been shown to have worse lung functions, more exacerbations, more need for oral corticosteroids. So finally, I think you have asked for a corticosteroid dependency. Corticosteroid dependency or use of patient being on corticosteroid are different. So dependency means that if you decrease the corticosteroids, the symptoms worsen. And if that happens, that is definitely a marker that this patient is uh, responsive to corticosteroids and hence the patient will be responsive to a biologic but it can be to either anti-IgE or anti-IL-5. So it will be broadly not uh, considered as anti-IL-5 marker. But uh, patient on corticosteroids and uh, if, if the corticosteroid are to be taken off the, you know, the prescription of the patient, then definitely anti-IL-5s, if the patient is a candidate for that, over omalizumab will be considered as a better choice. So we move on to another question. Next question, yeah, please. Yeah, so, so the next question is that uh, there are lots of questions. Where is the role of home nebulization in asthma? So where, where do we keep this now? Because we have all three drugs available. So which patients or which group of patients are likely to benefit with the home nebulization? Professor Jinder, would like to make any comment? I think the home nebulation uh, is certainly a boon, but it is not a replacement of inhalation therapy. So it is, should be used only on uh, as and when required basis. You see, and patients should be guided properly when to use it, how to use it. I suppose there, there are a lot of issues which are involved there so that... Um, uh, because sometimes you see a lot of uh, oral or inhaled corticosteroids which um, are taken in nebulation doses, obviously much higher. 
but otherwise uh, i don't think uh, it's a bad option for patients who do have severe exacerbations you see because uh, sometimes nothing else is available and uh, so it can be uh, can be used uh, but with the with discretion yeah, so. so basically it will be those patients who have got physical or mental uh, problems uh, in using a handheld devices or those patients who got say uh, a patient of arthritis he will not be able to use uh, these devices uh, the 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 handheld devices or a patient who requires high dosages of a drug which may not be possible to deliver by the these devices so there there could be some of the industry but as rightly said our attempt should always be to see that a patient if should be made to use a handheld device as the first choice and even if you have to give it a, a nebulization therapy for a short period all right but ultimate aim should be to bring him back to the handheld device that should be our policy but not as a regular because nebulization itself has got so many problems like um, which are often ignored like infection is something which is very important uh, various kinds of uh, pathogenic bacteria they flourish in this in the system and they can infect the patient so rather than giving any benefit we are harming the patient so it should have a limited role as professor as rightly said by professor jindal mm. next so there is one more question which is very uh, very very intriguing and i think very very appropriate that uh, gina is emphasizing on a written action plan so how does the how do the experts feel uh, about its feasibility in india where uh, patients are more likely to abuse this kind of written action plans if they have a uh, oral corticosteroid courses being written in that because that's the standard plan in uh, written asthma action plan that uh, if you feel worse then you take the steroids for 5 days first you take this inhaler and then go with this so uh, what is the opinion sir that's the question which has come sir dr katyar sir professor guleria i'd like to make any comment on this yes so this is something we tried many years ago in our asthmatic patients and i must say it didn't really work out in our country there are two issues one is as was mentioned by dr tulwar that there is a more inclination to use oral tablets rather than inhaled therapy and sometimes patients are also not comfortable as a matter of fact when we used it many of our patients said that we would rather have you tell us what we should do rather than then giving us an action plan and giving the responsibility of management to us they wanted it to be more physician driven rather than the patient driven so i think in our country the written action plan could be useful only a very select few it's not going to be something which can be used uh, across the board because our patients are slightly different and they are not the ones who are willing to accept a written action plan and there is always a chance of misuse because still the use of inhalers is associated with some degree of stigma and reluctance so it's something that we need to be aware of can you go to the next question dr talwar uh, randeep has brought this point very well because uh, somehow i think uh, pediatricians are more writing the action plans but i do not know how much mm -hmm. it is useful because uh, misuse is one and second is yes because i think if in the west because the physician is not available to advise them what have what is to be done in india that is not the situation the, the the moment they have an issue they will be able to get hold of a doctor very soon so shouldn't be a problem and that's why i think it it didn't work out as far as uh, our country is concerned i agree with randeep on that then there is a uh, one more question which is uh, here again it is uh, on the post nasal drip in a patient of severe asthma how do we how do we approach this situation saurabh you can saurabh can take this question yes sir so so, so all of us know that rhinitis and sinusitis is a common uh, problem with all these asthmatics roughly 70 to 80% will have and people whom we have seen with asthma coming with these are usually taking inhalers if we have prescribed them anti allergics also but they are not very fond of taking these those nasal sprays So I would say if we give them adequately a nasal spray also, which contains an inhaled corticosteroid, maybe with an antihistaminic, then their sinusitis and rhinitis problem gets taken care of. And usually these patients come back and then they tell that this complaint of post nasal drip has gone down significantly. Plus, even if we are not able to get give them the required benefit, I think so we should involve our ENT colleagues also regarding the management of this post nasal drip rather than treating these patients alone on anti-allergics, which we are commonly used to. 
treating them with so very rightly put uh, saurabh that uh, you know severe asthma is basically a multidisciplinary approach you might need a ent person you might need a gastroenterology because cough and worsening of symptoms may not be related to asthma may be related to this comorbidities i think that has been highlighted again very well in the gina that you need to see all these things very very uh, closely before you switch on to the uh, bandwagon of biologics and there is one more question on the biologics which uh, dr katia this is very interesting that uh, why wait step 5 mm -hmm. for advising biologics because they are able to prevent remodeling and uh, it is being shown now increasingly that it is causing remission in asthma by a use of beyond 2 years or 3 years so why why let it deteriorate to gina step 5 is the question which i think we addressed it in a part at that time but i think to the time to yeah. this question sir dr katia professor guleria i'd like to give you i think we addressed this question last time yeah. also yeah and the two factors that came out one of course was that the cost and we had said that if the cost comes down significantly then maybe it could come up as far as the treatment is concerned and i think more data which comes in terms of long term safety as far as the biologicals are concerned if we have these two things happening then i am sure that they will come up uh, in the steps as far as asthma is concerned because they are in a, in many ways uh, preventing airway remodeling and change the entire dynamics as far as the airway inflammation is concerned one question which dr katiar has come about peak flow monitoring how to practice by experts in their practice how how are they using it in their uh, practice peak flow monitoring which gina always talks about dr sarnay you like to address this yeah i think uh, this uh, this is very important question and some of it is not as frequently used in fact we again in our kind of chest clinic uh, the peak flow meter uh, normally will be measured Uh, at the arrival of the patient, just like it, we are measuring the patient's height, weight, blood pressure, like any other clinical parameter, and of course, uh, few of the patients would also have a peak peak flow meter at home. So, utility of this has to be established by the clinical team uh, in the chest clinic. And more the patient uses it, they themselves will uh, get to know. Like normally, they monitor the blood sugar for diabetes. similarly at least they will get to know whether the asthma symptoms and the severity or the measurements of the peak expiratory flow rate are going up or down so better control diurnal variation all these things can be further educated to these patients uh, provided the patient is receptive because some patients may be reluctant despite of our perseverance so if we pre select that population peak expiratory flow rate becomes a very important tool at least in getting to know it adds to the clinical objective evaluation of the patient for the clinician so saurabh can saurabh can you pitch in that which are your patients in which you would like to ask for a peak flow monitoring like it would be really difficult to do it in every patient but certain patients yes which group of those patients or at least i would say young people and who are educated enough who wants to reduce the dose of their medication who wants to take care of their asthma on their own i would say these will be the kind of people whom we should matlab advise them as already told and as already discussed that the patients when they are given a written asthma action plan they are not very compliant with these things so definitely young people who are like we were already discussing uh, turning from uh, from childhood asthma to adult onset asthma in those if you want to minimize the requirement of their drugs in those if you want to handle them uh, matlab give them the option of handling their own asthma then in those definitely i would say that peak flow meter is a good thing plus those patients whom we are dealing with having severe asthma they should definitely be given this kind of a device because for them it is obviously important to monitor the control of their disease as well as to step up when the control is going poor very rightly put forward this uh, point uh, saurabh and uh, i would only add this much that when diagnosis is in doubt and you want to demonstrate the variability that is again one of the situations where we can ask them to keep a record and show us that what is the variability going on anything else uh, randeep in your practice where you where would you put the peak flows so as has already been said by saurabh that in patients who are wanting to monitor their own asthma and see what is uh, being uh, done in the past we used to have a subgroup of asthma known as brittle asthma the asthmatics who had a very dramatic change in their uh, asthma control and they were 
all right in the morning but had severe asthma by evening in them monitoring peak flow meter does help in early intervention so in some subgroups of asthmatics where they are, are difficult to control or worsen very dramatically it could be used as a guide to help them decide of uh, in terms of their better asthma control so i don't think any other question at the moment here except for that what is the effect of uh, uh, covid 19 on severe exacerbation of asthma so this is dr kamal who has asked this question dr katiar i think there was enough discussion on this so just <laughs> yeah yeah you give the now the bullet point uh i think uh, there is one thing to certain that uh, mild and moderate asthmatics need not uh, worry about management uh, uh, management part as far as covid 19 is concerned it's so only severe asthma cases who would require cautions to be taken who where we have to be little careful and especially those who are taking oral corticosteroids because uh, they have uh, their their prognosis uh, uh, often uh, may 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 be in uh, they may be in trouble if they get covid 19 so it's only the serious serious severe cases of asthma where we have to be concerned but otherwise mild to moderate the management should continue as such the same medication which they are taking and if they have to upgrade their uh, treatment they in consultation with their physician they may have to do so So very nicely summarized by you sir and uh, i would just add here that uh, recently we convey uh, uh, conducted this uh, study retrospectively that those patients who were on biologicals in this last 3 years of covid and uh, those who carried on none of them had actually covid it was very very surprising but uh, some of them who discontinued during this covid time they had covid but they also didn't have a severe covid or th- things like that but they had covid so only only thing is that uh, it was very surprising to see that uh, we couldn't get even one patient who was compliant to biologics during covid had covid so this was something very striking feature which we got in this study so if there are no more questions then uh, sir you can summarize and then uh, i would like i would like to say thank to everyone i think we had a very good and fruitful discussion and i must thank all the experts for uh, sparing their time and um, taking part in this uh, important issue of um, new gina guidelines and i am i'm sure the audience would be benefited a lot in and they will be they will they will be helped a lot while managing their cases of uh, asthma more scientifically thank you thank you so much uh, all of you please so thank you very much dr katiar thank you dr jindal thank you dr guleria thank you dr sarnaik dr vijay kumar dr saurabh dr chandrakant tarke dr uh, everybody who has been there for the last two wednesdays and uh, giving almost uh, collectively 3 hours of their time to actually thread bearing the gina update 2023 as uh, dr jindal also said in the beginning that it does not look that there is a some uh, you know uh, drastic changes which gina has brought but looking at thread bear we found there are lots of take home points which we have discussed about drug interactions and many other things of course uh, newer terminologies many things have been introduced and some of them are actually right for practice some of them will be of course uh, you know adapted to practice according to our own set of circumstances as professor jindal has put in so i have no words to express my thanks and gratitude to senior faculty my colleagues and of course my very very young and upcoming the best pulmonologists which are coming like saurabh and chandrakant tarke for being on this two days marathon program and uh, viewers this was the first mm-hmm. time in update 2023 was discussed so we at the indian chess society with a knowledge partner glenmark thank each and every one for enlightening us and of course keeping them on our website which is indianchesssociety.org where you can actually archive them and see the comments of all these experts on gina update 
Thank you, everyone. Good night. And we will be meeting next Wednesday again at 8 p.m. We are going to do discuss about hot mix in COPD. So what better can be after asthma if we bring what is new in COPD? So, so till then, goodbye to everyone. Bye-bye. Good night.